Welcome, Leon, and uh, thank you very much for your time and on doing this uh, talk on autism in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Um, it's really uh, wonderful to have you, you know, volunteering your time so generously. So for those who don't know Leon, uh, Leon is a psychoanalytic theorist and a, a psychological counselor from Berlin. Uh, his work draws on Freudian ideas and Lacanian ideas. And his interest lies in the understanding of the relationship between culture and psychopathology. Um, his book, The Autistic Subject on the Threshold of Language, which was a bestseller uh, in psychology. Um, and he is also the founder of the Lacanian Affiliates in Berlin and Unconscious Berlin, and is currently a research fellow at the International Psychoanalytic University of Berlin and the Hans Killian University. But Leon, thank you very much for your time and it, it is wonderful to have you here. I'm gonna pass over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike, uh, for the introduction. Um, thank you all for being here today. It's lovely to see some uh, familiar faces and some familiar names. Um, so yes, as, as Mike noted, um, I've uh, published a book on autism about two years ago um, with uh, Springer Publishing and uh, it's a book that culminated um, about uh, five years of research that I've done in the field. And um, well, the book goes really in depth uh, and provides a, a detailed analysis of autism uh, from this particular perspective that I'll try to um, provide you with a rudimentary introduction to. Yes. So all of you that are interested to read more and discuss more, more, first of all, I always say this, you're welcome to get in touch with me. Otherwise you can find a book uh, or also, um, yeah, you can also uh, get in touch and request that I send you uh, some of my recent papers on the subject. Yeah. Uh, but today, um, instead of really delving into the, um, let's say the technical language, um, uh, that well is necessary to uh, to be acquainted with in order to uh, get access to the nuances that this perspective provides on autism. Today we will try to um, uh, see generally what uh, we're aiming at uh, when we think of autism in this way. Now, before I, I I start with giving you my own perspective. Let's start with how autism is commonly defined today. And I'm sure that um, most of you, if not all of you know that autism is determined today as a developmental disorder, particularly a disorder that affects the brain's normal development of social and communication skills. And also um, is typified by repetitive patterns of behavior. So you can find this um, particular description in the DSM which I'll talk about in, in a second. Now, autism is unique uh, as it appears in early infancy and also commonly is provided with a poor prognosis. And uh, those of you that are familiar uh, with um, the way that uh, practitioners, practitioners talk about autism today, you would know that there is a term called high functioning and low functioning autism. Uh, the low functioning would be a more severe type of autism, which entails extreme withdrawal from the world and what is called, and I'll use uh, scare quotes um, just because I'm not a, a, an avid participant of, of this particular discourse, but uh, it's called non-adaptive routines and, and behaviors. So this would be the severe low functioning autism. And on the other side, there are the high functioning autistic people, which live a relatively normal life and commonly struggle with communication skills and social skills. Now, when talking about autism, we have to mention even briefly, uh, Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, because they're the first two psychologists, psychiatrists that um, defined autism as a distinct syndrome. Right? It's important to know that before the time of Kanner and Asperger, autism was considered to be um, a, a particular type of psychosis a childhood psychosis, a psychosis that comes into play early on in childhood. 
Now, Kana and Asperger um, redefined our approach to it. And uh, well, I really think, uh, and I'll just mention this uh, before we continue that, it, it might be extremely useful to go back to Kana today, which provided us with some very interesting metapsychological categories uh, such as sameness and aloneness. And I'll leave it at that. And maybe if we do another talk, we can talk particularly about Kana. But today we won't really delve into that. Now, finally, today, um, autism is commonly uh, diagnosed using the DSM-5, uh, which provides a standardized method to identify and diagnose autism. And autistic people, uh, which I will call subjects from now on, uh, are diagnosed on a spectrum. So this is called the autis Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD. And it's a spectrum that includes um, multiplicity and variety of deficits in social interaction, social communications, types of behaviors, etc. And as I mentioned uh, before, this is a quantitative model, meaning uh, you will be diagnosed as low functioning if you have more, let's say, autistic traits and uh, have more, struggle more with communication and social skills, and you'll be diagnosed as high functioning when you have less. So it's a question of quantity here, where we have two qualitatively distinct metapsychological categories out of DSM, by the way, low functioning and high functioning is, does, do not exist in DSM, but these are two metapsychological categories which we can uh, associate with autism today. Now, when we talk about the etiology in autism, and this will generally be our topic today, um, I speak a lot about autism in many uh, in many opportunities, and every time I try and mix things up a little bit. So we'll we'll try and uh, and see uh, where this takes us today. So commonly, when people think about etiology in autism, they think about a genetic, a uh, physiological, or a biological origin, and there are many studies trying to define uh, these uh, factors in autism. Um, I can just uh, quickly say that it doesn't th there is th there is no conclusive result today uh, that will uh, address a particular uh, causality in these terms uh, but we'll leave that uh, to an for another time now today we're going to talk about the psychoanalysis of autism and in the history of psychoanalysis there have been uh, many psychoanalysts that did engage with the notion of autism. And when they talk about uh, terms such as etiology, uh, they do not um, search for it in the genetic or biological features of the subject, but in its biography. And the fact that psychoanalysts uh, uh, focus on biographical aspects as uh, causal factors in the onset of, well, many types of psychic phenomenon, but let's say autism in particular. In the case of autism, this gave rise to a pressing polemic against the implementation of psychoanalysis in cases of autism. And some of you might have heard about this, especially in France, uh, where uh, we see um, people saying that psychoanalysts, when they engage with autism, they always blame the mother. And it's true. I think that's very true that in the history of psychoanalysis, some analysts have gone on this route. Uh, I can mention notable names, very important psychoanalysts in the history of psychoanalysis, like Margaret Mahler, Bruno Bettelheim, Donald Meltzer, Franz Tustin, who did a lot of work in the field of art research. And we see in their works, we see concepts and notions having to do with this causal factor in autism, such as the depressed mother, cold mother, separation from the mother. And so we have that in the history of psychoanalysis. But I I really want to emphasize that I think that when we read these writers, these scholars, we see that the theoretical richness uh, of their psychoanalytic texts, it does 
greatly surpass this particular one. And well, I'll, I'll mention briefly, I'll mention Bettelheim, which is blamed many times for this, uh, for this uh, type of problematic. Uh, and he wrote the book, The Empty Fortress, a very interesting book. He writes about his experience working with autistic subjects. And in the book, he says about uh, the relationship to the mother, he says, it's not the maternal attitude that produces autism, but the child's spontaneous reaction to it. And this is quite clear, I think, uh, for many psychoanalysts, I'm sure in the audience today that practice analysis and, um, you know, it's very clear that we cannot um, determine the psyche uh, uh, on the basis of cold biographical facts. You know, one patient might uh, experience a certain trauma in childhood, even a, a very uh, brutal trauma. Uh, another patient will, might experience a similar trauma, but this does not necessarily mean that this symptom uh, will evolve in the same way. So, and this is what Bettelheim is emphasizing here. He's emphasizing the spontaneous reaction of the subject. And here I say many times, Bettelheim is uh, the most Lacanian that he's ever been. Uh, but in any case, what I will present today, the framework that I will present today, does not adhere to the motif of the cold mother in any way. It is rooted in a linguistic approach to psychoanalysis that is progressed by French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Lacan is a famous and notorious psychoanalyst from the 20th century, late 20th century France. And well, I base um, the lion's share of my work on his uh, writings and teachings and uh, the writings of his followers. And I also belong to the Lacanian orientation today. So in my work, I abide by uh, this particular orientation. Now, when we think about Lacanian psychoanalysis, there's so much to say, and, uh, and we won't say it all today, but I'll just say something important that we have to acknowledge at the outset, that for, for Lacanians or in the Lacanian orientation, we never talk about a normal or healthy subject. There is no such thing. Um, there are only ways of making do, let's say, with um, what we lack. And these diagnostic categories like neurosis, perversion, psychosis, they are just names for ways uh, that a certain uh, rupture between the inner world of the subject and its environment is such it. So in this sense, we never talk about a subject in which the inner world and the environment correspond, where there is no uh, rupture to be treated. The symptom is the treatment of this rupture. And well, we might call this a neurotic symptom, a perverse symptom, and a psychotic symptom. In my book on autism, I argue that autism is a singular, unique way to engage with this uh, rupture. And this is why I suggest that autism is a singular subjective structure or mental structure um, that must be, um, let's say, engaged with in the clinic in a unique way. Now, in order to understand this notion of this rupture, I want you to imagine this hypothetical wild animal that is the perfect wild animal because it lives in the wild and it survives magnific magnificently. Right? On this wild animal, you might say that the instinct, because it is wild, right? the instinct is sufficient in ensuring this correspondence between the inner feelings of the animal, whatever is perceived and felt, and the animal world, the environment of this animal. Now, I always give an example, uh, well, 
not for a wild animal because you know for in the case of domesticated animals we kind of ruined it a little bit for them by introducing them through language right but i'll give this example um, it's it's a it's a nice one um i was in canada a few years ago at a um, cow research center it was also a farm and the uh, the phd students they uh, woke me up in the middle of the night and they told me Oh, you have to come and see um, a, a cow is giving birth. This is miraculous. And we went, it was four in the morning, and we went to see what's going on there. And yes, it was quite uh, fantastic. But I was extremely impressed by the fact that the little cow was born and immediately started walking around, sniffing uh, the, the, the environment, sort of searching for food, I guess. It was just um, roaming around this little uh, pod that, that it was born in it. It was very much uh, impressive. There is a certain level uh, that is promised with the instinct. The animal is born and the instinct is in fact sufficient enough to enable it to exist, to survive in its environment. Now, as I'll soon explain, for humans, this is not the case. We are born instinctually insufficient. Uh, babies are not set for the life in the complicated human world. And what we argue in the Lacanian orientation, um, being brief here, is that the way we bridge this rupture is by relying on language. Right? We rely the way language affects our body in order to uh, project ourselves into the humanized world and function with it. And in this sense, these structural types uh, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, which I gave you the names already, are determined by the way language affects the body in this way. And autism is one of these ways. Now, many people criticize uh, Lacan and Lacanians by saying, well, they're so focused on language and language is not everything. There's, this, there's a level, there's an affective level and there's something that is not about language. Now, because of that, I want to emphasize something and begin our venture into the more Lacanian aspect of this lecture by trying to introduce you to a broader definition of language. So when I will say language, or when I've said language, I, I do not mean the English language, the one that I'm talking um, right now. When I refer to language, I refer to anything that is psychically inscribed. Right? So think about it in this way. You know, experience is fleeting. You can open uh, the writings of uh, the philosopher David Hume. He, he describes it quite uh, profoundly. He says that every moment is a different experience. Every second is a new impression. And well, the thing well, that makes all of our experiences uh, belong to one subject, well, this is what we call psychic inscription, memory. So in this case, I would say uh, for the psychologist in the crowd, you'll identify this term, episodic memory, right? This is the memory that uh, stores the story that is told from our perspective. Right? And what I refer to language, I mean, yes, language is necessary to record this story. So in order for there to be a certain consistency, in order for experience to be more than fleeting, to be preserved from one moment to the other, we have to rely on language. Not the English language, but any type of psychic inscription. Now, okay, this is, this is quite commonsensical, but we should also think, think about other things, let's say, in our uh, existence, in our re reality that remain permanent, but are not episodic. For instance, uh, talents, skills, more basic modes of understanding that we acquire in our lives. And if we assume that they have some kind of permanence, we assume that they are also inscribed psychically. But in this case, well, in the episodic memory, I can consciously recount it. In this case, in the case of talents, like riding a bicycle, some elements, some aspects from 
this kind of understanding is unconsciously inspired. Right? But and language operates here too. Language is also what we regard to as the field, the domain, which these talent skills are inscribed. So we can think of language as whatever marks permanence in our life. And psychoanalytically, when we now venture a step further, we might say that language is exactly what records these first impressions that are recorded in our body. I will have a talk in a few months about uh, my notion of the skin uh, and the dermic drive. So we would say that the skin is developed in the womb even before the baby in, is born and it bestows on the baby these sensations. And if we say that these sensations have a lasting effect, if they leave an impression on the psyche, we're already talking about language. But it's not all, only the body, it's also our identity, our sexuality and also our role and function in society. All of those are rooted in our mode of access to language. So language is important. And today we're going to talk particularly about the entry into language, which is very important to think about when we discuss autism from this perspective. And Let's say, linguistically speaking, I would say that there are different ways to enter language. And psychoanalytically speaking, I'll say that the entry into language happens exactly in that moment where something on the level of bodily excitation is inscribed. And what I want to venture to say further is that these different modes of subjectivity, these uh, that I've described earlier, neurosis, perversion, psychosis, autism, have different relationships to language based on different modes of entry into language. And this is language before meaning, right? It is language on the level of the body, on the level of the parcellation of the body, and what Freud called drive, tri. And what I'd like to suggest today is that this entry into language is traumatic. And the question that is asked on the level that Bettelheim was reminding us, on the level of this spontaneous reaction of the subject, is how does the subject react to the traumatic element of the entry into language? And I'll try to, to give you a um, sort of a, a myth a story in order for you to uh, grasp what I'm aiming at in terms of the traumatic aspect of the entry into language. And again, uh, well, contrast to the story about this lovely cow that uh, was born in Canada, um, human babies are not born that way. They're born inadequate, organically inadequate, and are utterly dependent on their caregiver to survive. And if we hypothesize that, well, hmm, let's make a hypothesis. I, I don't support it, but for the sake of our discussion, let's say that in the womb, the fetus's instinctual needs are immediately satisfied. After the baby is born, there necessarily comes a moment where it is truly insufficient and its needs are not satisfied. For instance, the baby is hungry, and there is no food immediately. This happens. Now, this introduces a lack into the mother-child economy. And this lack compels the baby to utter what we will call today an appeal to the caregiver. In Lacanese, in Lacanian terms, we would say an appeal to the big other. This is a very loaded term. It has many uh, meanings and definitions. And I'll just drop it here and we'll see. We might, we might engage with it a little bit soon. So the baby articulates this cry and it articulates it in a language that the caregiver has to pick up on what we might call the mother tongue or the mother's tongue. 
And he has to articulate this cry in its mother's tongue and address it to the caregiver in order to quench the unbearable tension that is roused by the unfulfilled instinctual need. And when the baby vocalizes the cry, we say in the Lacanian orientation that the baby is alienated. And the baby is alienated on three corresponding levels. First, the baby has to translate something of its most intimate instinctual dynamic. Think about hunger, think about being hungry, think about how much this experience is uh, total. It, now think about a baby experiencing hunger. This is such an intimate vivacity, a, a strong vivacity of the body, and this uh, element has to be translated into a linguistic utterance that can never fully encapsulate it. And so this is the first alienation. Second alienation is the fact that the baby has to do so by relying on an alien language, a language that the caregiver can understand. It's a language that precedes, predates the existence of the baby and belongs to the big other. Third alienation is the fact that by appealing to the other with the cry, the baby in fact retroactively constitutes the other as the place from which its needs can be answered. And in this, the baby is forfeiting the illusion of self-sufficiency. Now, I want to make a side note. This is a story. This is a myth. I am not providing you with the psychology of babies. I don't think babies really think about this. This does not go through their mind. But this threefold uh, alienation is a structural description of the entry into life. Right? Again, the myth was helpful in order to explain what we're talking about here, just like the Oedipus. Now, from a Lacanian perspective, we would say that this moment is the moment of alienation in language, and autistic subjects find the alienation in language to be unbearable, life-threatening, and even mutilating. And if we go back to Bruno Bettelheim, he suggests, for instance, that autism originates in a moment of extreme helplessness that presents itself in a completely unpredictable and life-threatening manner from which there is no escape. So we would say that autistic subjects refuse to take the, the language of the other on themselves. They refuse to make an appeal to the other. And so in terms of etiology, this is what we define as the spontaneous reaction on the level of autism, a refusal to make an appeal to the big other, a refusal of the alienation in language. Now, it's important to stress that this does not mean that autistic subjects are out of language. Clearly, that is false. When we open uh, Google Scholar, we can find many studies that show that more than half of the children that are diagnosed as being autistic present a variety of verbalization, even at a very young age. Right? And these can be very sophisticated, ritualistic vocalizations. Um, these could be sounds that accompany stereotypical behavior, what is called behavior. It could be echolalia, repetition of words and sounds. Uh, many autistic subjects invade a private code language. And many others have these form of controlled uh, and well-defined verbalizations. And all of these types of verbalizations that present themselves at an early age, well, we can in fact um, say or hypothesize that they are used to achieve a personal and solitary form of vocal satisfaction. And moreover, when we think about uh, the autistic access to language at this age, we can clearly see that autistic children have a very good memory and can clearly understand the world around them and the things people say under particular circumstances. So 
these show to us that, well, it is one thing to gain access to language, and it is another thing to use language in order to make an appeal to the other. And this distinction is very important, and it is what we will explore today and the rest of our time. And, well, I might present to you in the outset what, what sort of the hypothesis or the idea is that what I think is that the implementation of one's linguistic capacity in active communication, let's say, in an appeal, necessitates the involvement of the subject's free will, what we might call the will to speak. And corresponding to this, we would say that it is exactly the traumatic aspect of the alienation in language and what we will call today the use of the voice that prevents autistic subjects from willingly engaging in communication. So we will explore uh, autism today as a phenomenon that is rooted in, a, in the subject's willful retention of the voice and what we can describe as a unique form of uh, radical uh, selective mutism. So we're going to talk a little bit about the voice now, and this is a psychoanalytic notion. And when we do so, we are now going to take a few steps back to our discussion of the alienation in language. So we have defined uh, the uh, we have uh, engaged the etiology of autism in terms of the refusal of the alienation in language, the refusal of an appeal to the other. And now we're going to uh, engage with it in terms of the autistic retention of the voice. Now, this is a, a, a major part of, uh, of my thesis on autism in my book. And I can also recommend the work of Jacques-Claude Maléval, who wrote a lot about the voice in autism. Uh, generally speaking, when we uh, engage with the voice, we are in fact, dealing with a theory of drive or trieb in psychoanalysis. And basically what we refer to here is, and I'll give a, a, a more, a deeper explanation to this, but basically what we refer to is a refusal to invest the intimate dimension of the voice, the intimate, let's say, subjective dimension of the voice, in a language that is other, in an alien place outside of myself. Or we can say it is the refusal to assume an enunciative position, a position of enunciation. Now, what is the voice in psychoanalysis? Uh, I'll start by saying what it is not, <laughs> uh, so we can get this uh, off the table. So. The voice uh, in Lacanian psychoanalysis is not what we hear when we speak. It's not that. It's, not, it's also not the intonation of speech per se, the, the vocality or sound of speech. This is not what we're referring to. The voice is also not the meaning that is conveyed in speech. This is not the voice. And the voice is also not the materiality of the body, let's say the movement of the mouth and the tongue. All of these are not rejected by the autistic subject, and we can see that, right? Autistic subjects make sounds, they use different intonations, uh, they sometimes make uh, meaningful uh, expressions, and they can definitely play with the material of the body when making these sounds, right? So when we say that the autistic subject rejects uh, the voice, we are not saying, we are not talking about this. The voice in uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis is defined as a remainder of the alienation in language. So, in other words, it is a remainder of the assimilation of the body's expressive intention in this language, in this language that belongs to an other. It is what um, we can say detaches itself from the body when a meaningful utterance uh, is addressed to another. 
So in this sense, we think of the voice as what carries the presence of the subject in speech. Right? It, 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 it is what makes speech more than a vocalization, but a line of communication between enunciating subjects. And in order to understand this a bit um, more, we'll make a distinction, we'll follow a distinction that Lacan makes between uh, enunciation and statement, and correspondingly between the subject of enunciation and the subject of the statement. So the subject of the statement uh, would be um, the way a person uh, and others surrounding this person um, perceive him or her consciously. So for instance, uh, you know that uh, my name is Leon Brenner and um, I, uh, you, you know, maybe you know some things about me, maybe you have some ideas, I don't know. And well, uh, I am the person speaking, right? You heard this word, I, that's very important. Right? The subject of the statement is all, always referred to by these linguistic elements like I, she, he. And when you think about this twice, these linguistic elements have no meaning unless they are tied to the message in the sentence. For, for instance, when you think about the word she, it's meaningless unless I say um, she is very clever. Right? So when I give out this uh, predicate, when I give you further meaning to attach to this particular linguistic element, then we learn something about the she. Now, the subject of the statement is exactly this she, this I, this he, this they, that is um, thought about consciously in so far as we think of ourselves under predication. Things like being clever, being he is a good boy, etc. Right, for example. And in psychoanalysis, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, we associate this subject with the ego. Right? So the ego would be this construction, this psychic construction, which Freud um, meticulously defined as being secondary in the psyche, that, um, let's say, collects all of these words, all of these predications in our lives and attaches them to it in uh, particular types of identification. We build this ego in our lives and the ego, the I, uh, the person that uh, might be called Leon Brenner is uh, sometimes a subject of a statement. And you might say some nice things, some uh, not so nice things after this lecture. Leon Brenner would be the subject of the statement in your utterance. Now, the subject of enunciation, on the other hand, is not related to the level um, of the enunciated statement, but to the act of enunciation itself. Right, so the subject of enunciation is not what is encapsulated in the meaning. It is not what we predicate in a sentence. Right? The subject of enunciation comes into being or is referred to exactly in moments where something is not captured by predication in speech. It is a byproduct of speech, something that surprises us, um, right? not something that um, produces discourse like this, one that makes the sentence, but something that is produced by discourse. And we associate the enunciative presence of the voice with this subject. And think about this. There is always something alienating in hearing your voice when it's recorded, right? Uh, you hear your voice, there's something strange about it. There, there's something uh, a bit um, alien uh, that is not captured in the meaning, it's not exactly the, 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 the intonation, but it is something that has to do with your, let's say, intimate uh, presence as an enunciator, which all of a sudden you sort of meet. Right? Now, take this uh, into mind. This does not necessarily happen when you hear yourself sing. Right? 
So when we talk about this alienating aspect that is marked out by the enunciative dimension of the voice, we are talking about something that is marked out when we invest our voice in language. Right? So it has to be invested in order to convey meaning. And only when we use a language that is alien to us and go through this alienation that robs us of something that is our own, that is intimate, that has to do with the intimate relationship that we have with our voice, do we have this feeling. So the enunciative voice is that part of our speech that marks out this alienation, exactly the price for participating in a community of enunciators. Now, the fact that we hear it only uh, when it is recorded shows us that something of this loss is repressed. Uh, well, for the neurotic subjects in the crowd, right? I won't generalize. For neurotics, something is repressed in terms of the trauma traumatism of the alienation in language. And well, uh, this is why we don't hear it all the time. Yes? We have to sort of uh, have it hit us in the face when we hear ourselves recorded in order to encounter something about this loss, something about the fact that by taking language on ourselves, we in fact pay a big price. And as I said earlier, autistic subjects choose not to pay this price. Instead of repressing this loss, they choose to refuse it. And in this sense, while they can speak clearly, it is difficult for them to carry their enunciative presence in speech. Um, so uh, we might even say, and uh, you can read many autistic testimonies on this point, that they do anything in their capacity to avoid this enunciative presence. So in order to speak, they have to find ways around it. You know what, let's, I'll, I'll give you another angle on this and, and then we will wrap things up by returning into these um, workarounds that uh, autistic subjects invent. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll get a little more linguistic right now. We'll talk a bit about Roman Jakobson, um, who was a linguist, uh, belongs to the uh, tradition of semiotics, and he had this very interesting notion called the phatic function of language. So the phatic function is, um, this is how uh, Jakobson describes it, is a dimension of language that solely establishes a line of communication between speaking agents, right? It, it, it has nothing to do with the meaning that language conveys. It is a certain function that language has to establish a line of communication between speakers. Um, you might know this from these uh, movies about the military, right? They have these um, over, right? Or uh, Roger, right? They have these words. They don't mean anything. They don't say anything about the situation of the subject. They just say, I'm here, I'm listening to you, a speaker. Yes, this is an establishment of a line of a communication. Uh, so when we speak about the phatic function, we speak about a function that establishes the purely intersubjective factor in speech. The factor that is independent from the meaningful content that is communicated uh, between agents. And this different angle that I want to give you before we, we continue is that when you um, talk to autistic individuals that are very proficient in using language, uh, we encounter a variety of coping strategies that they employ in an attempt to speak without actively engaging in the phatic function. So, for instance, uh, some autistic subjects use a very monotonic voice, devoid of affect. It is not my voice. I am not here. This is not expressing my subjective affective state. For instance, some use very high-pitched voice, voices. Uh, so this is not my voice. This is the voice of a cat. Uh, some use uh, dolls uh, that 
portrayed and, and portray these dolls as the actual enunciators when they speak. So they speak in proxy. So there's a doll and when the doll is with the subject, they can speak sometimes in a different voice, but when the doll is in their presence, they can speak. They can engage in communication with others. And some autistic subjects just repeat sentences and words in the exact intonation and order in which they heard them in the first place. So in this case, it is not I, I who is not me who is speaking. It is this person that I've heard before saying this sentence. I'm exactly mimicking the exact intonation and order of the words that I heard. So what we see is that all of these are strategies that are implemented to engage in a unique form of speech that solely conveys information and is utterly devoid of the intersubjective dimension of language. This exactly is what we talk about as the presence as enunciator, the enunciative position. So we would say that these are the strategies that autistic subjects use in order to speak in proxy without engaging in an enunciative presence. So mm, I think we can start wrapping things up and uh, we'll have some time for questions, but I'll just briefly touch on, on the question, well, so if this is the case, if, um, if we can describe autism as, uh, as a refusal of the alienation in language, that one of its dimensions is the retention of the voice, or in other words, the refusal of encountering an enunciative position, taking a position of enunciation. How do autistic subjects do find their way into speech? How do they do it? How do they overcome this traumatism? So again, I've written a lot about this and I'll just briefly introduce you to some ideas that I hope will make you furious. Um, so what I would generally say is that first, when we, well, I'll just mention that the answer to this question, uh, well, at least I found some answers to this question by engaging with testimonies of autistic subjects. Right? So it's not so much uh, uh, an outcome of uh, pure theorizing or uh, let's say uh, a group of psychologists sitting in a room and discussing cases. Uh, it, these are solutions that autistic subjects invent and you can find it in the literature. And it seems that in order to, mm, let's say, uh, enter language in this way, enter a language that uh, can at some point be used uh, for communication, uh, one has to first find the value of a linguistic vocalization that is not phatic, right? And in autism, we see a lot of examples for that. For instance, you know, uh, language, utterances, vocalizations, they can be enjoyable. They can give us pleasure. I'll give you an example. I've, uh, a few months ago, I've been in a dinner, holiday dinner, and there were kids playing around, uh, singing a holiday song. And then one of the children found out that if, if he changes a particular phoneme in the sentence, it's a very famous sort of holiday chanting. If he changes a particular phoneme, the sentence becomes dirty, becomes a dirty sentence. And he found that out and all the kids found that out and they were singing that song with a different phoneme the whole night having a blast just by saying something again and again and again. You see, there is a joy in speaking. There is a joy in language that is not about the meaning, right? But about the fact that language can convey meaning. And well, in this little linguistic joke, they found pleasure. And autistic subjects find similar types of pleasure in vocalizations. So I would say this is well necessary in order to take a step in language, to find out that language can be used for gaining pleasure. There's a fantastic YouTube clip 
um, it's called In Our Language. Um, I forget the name of the, uh, of the autistic uh, writer. It will come back to me. But you can find this, this, um, this on YouTube, and it's a, an absolutely fantastic uh, representation of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, uh, what is described there as forms of communication uh, with the world. This is the pleasure that autistic subjects find in these utterances. Another important aspect of language that has to be, uh, let's say, encountered uh, first is also the fact that language has a protective function as well. Right? So this can, um, uh, first we can associate this with what many autistic subjects call stimming. Now you can find this on Wikipedia. Uh, this is stimulating behavior, uh, what, what psychologists call psych, uh, 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 stereotypical behavior. Uh, many autistic subject call stimming. It's just a repetition of movements, usually accompanied with sounds. It could be a repetition of sounds of particular words that treat anxiety. So let's say stimming is a particular mode of protection that is enabled by uh, language. And when the autistic subject discovers that, well, language can be used to protect myself against these invasion of excitation that I constantly feel, well, this is a necessary step into language. This is, of course, progressed into a more complex engagement with words and vocabulary. And for instance, there is a famous um, case study that I've recently read um, about a, a child that had, well, memorized particular words that are associated with elements uh, that might uh, raise some anxiety and tension for him, and he would recite these names accompanied by a negation. So, I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, let's say washing machine, no washing machine. And by using a linguistic negation, he was able to treat uh, exactly these um, moments of anxiety and tension. So, we see that language has a protective function, and well, in order to engage in what let's say, uh, we might call a com communication, first the child has to find a way into the protective dimension of the language. And finally, many autistic children discover quite early in their lives that language is very useful uh, for manipulating people, manipulating animals and objects. It has an effect on the world. Right? So uh, in this sense, uh, language is useful. So finding these uses of language, which, um, well, precede uh, the level of communication, is a way into language, a way towards uh, the uh, intersubjective dimension of language. Now, when working with, with uh, children and adults on this level, the question is how to slowly introduce the intersubjective dimension of uh, language. And it's important to mention that it is uh, not only the subject's own enunciated presence that is uh, felt as uh, terrifying, but also the enunciative presence of others, right? So when engaging with uh, clinical work with autistic subjects, uh, it is important not to impose your presence as enunciator at uh, an early point, right? And we see we see a quite, uh, let's say, uh, difficult examples in the literature when this is done. So the idea is to, well, let's say, slowly introduce this dimension. Uh, in psychoanalytic terms, you might say slowly introducing uh, what we might call an autistic form of transference, right? one that uh, enables your existence as an other. Right? And I would say that generally we would um, we would be supporting these strategies that uh, the subject invents in order to bypass the enunciative dimension, but still engage in communication with others. Um, now these are moments and moments that can be cultivated and moments that cannot be predicted many times. What can I say, let's say, collecting from, from the uh, 
literature. Well, uh, using written words is one way to do it. The written word petrifies something of the enunciated sentence. A written word, commonly for most subjects, is not accompanied by a voice. So in introducing the intersubjective dimension can be done by entering language through the written word, through a, a, a written exchange, um, and there are many methods uh, that, uh, that do that. Uh, what uh, we would do here, well, again, remaining cautious in taking a position of enunciation, and on the same note, we would say that there are other in-proxy strategies, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, um, that can be cultivated, uh, preserved, supported, and developed in the work uh, with this particular uh, artistic subject. Now, before I, I, um, I finish today, I'll just really briefly, I've been briefly mentioning a lot of things today. Huh? So maybe uh, I'll have to expand on that at another time. But let me just briefly mention that um, I do believe that there is a way to gain access to a supplementary enunciative position in autism. This means to establish an intimate relationship with one's position as an enunciator in a community of enunciators. And this you find, uh, well, you find evidence and testimonies that um, direct you to these kind of moments in, 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 in famous case studies like the one of Williams, uh, Donna Williams, and uh, also uh, Temple Grandin, you, you find some examples there uh, where you see that the subject stages a loss on the level of speech, right? So we would call these moments, which would be a completely different clinical direction that, than the previous one, right? Which uh, I would say previous one was a bit more pedagogical, right? But still leaves room for the subject's invention. So it does not come with preconceived notions. But this, this particular modality um, would entail, um, creating something, like, well, the subject would create something on the level of the voice, something that is intimate and situated at a place beyond the reach of the subject. And these well, could be, um, let's say, moments of staging or imaginary staging of a loss uh, that provides these speaking crutches. Um, let's say uh, Williams describes how she uh, learn to speak and gained uh, a, 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 a closer relationship with language through her relationship with the doubles she saw in the mirror. So she saw uh, images in the mirror which were other people, had names, had personalities, and through uh, her equation with these doubles she learned something about language and about herself and her body. And Williams describes how she stages a funeral for some of her doubles and she buries them in a matchbox in a place in the backyard, does a ceremony and makes sure that nobody sees that. And she said that after she has lost them in this way, something uh, on the level of her bodily dynamism and relationship with language drastically changed. So here we're talking about a change in position. Right? And we see it in this staging. Um, another thing that comes to mind is um, you know, these creative engagements with the voice that entail a loss. And I'm reminded of another case study of a boy that recorded his voice on a tape and gave this cassette tape to his analyst to keep in her drawer. And in this sense, by um, submitting, by losing something on the level of the body and giving it to the analyst, establishing already a transference and giving it to the analyst to take it to his place, to keep it there forever, there was a, a drastic dynamic change in, um, in the analysis and, in, in, well, a, a drastic change in this boy's life. So these are just examples. And I'll just finish by saying that in any case, forcing a subject to take a position of enunciation is not the way to go. Uh, what I would say, um, 
is the hallmark of the Lacanian orientation. Way is working with the subject to find a unique way to safely deposit its voice in a place outside of its immediate conform. So we would always follow the unique inventions of the subject. And this is what is generally called a case by case uh, perspective. And I think that the clinic of autism is uh, one of the most, um, let's say, um, uh, one that uh, stands out in demanding uh, this, uh, this case by case perspective and the uh, complete uh, and utter respect to the singularity of, of the subject's inventions. I think I'll stop here. Um, I think that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll have a sip of my tea that's already cold. And uh, I think, Mike, we can uh, maybe take some questions. If you can ask them slowly, it will give me more time to uh, unwind a little bit. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Wow. Um, you know, we could do more of these, but we'll talk, over, we'll talk further. <laughs> um, it is wonderful. So we've got quite a lot of questions and a lot of comments. So we're going to start with Seth uh, from California. How's it, Seth? Hi, yes, thank you. Great presentation. Um, my question is you, you suggested earlier uh, a distinction between uh, psychosis and autism in the, I guess, the orientation of the real in the Lacanian formation. Um, could you speak a little bit more what you were saying there? I, you kind of got there a little bit in the end, but I, could you address that directly a little longer? Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Seth, for this question. I'll, I'll give you, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I might surprise you by saying that I've spent uh, many, many pages have been published under my pen engaging with this particular question. Um, because, uh, well, you know that um, when uh, Lacan uh, expands on his uh, understanding of psychosis, he finds it extremely fruitful to compare it to neurosis. And that's uh, very true. And I think that it is extremely fruitful to learn about autism from its comparison, to learn about the singularity of autism from its comparison to uh, psychosis. Moreover, I would say that uh, even in the Lacanian orientation, I say this is as though it is a huge faux pas, but no, uh, as they say, some of my best friends think uh, uh, around, think on this uh, line of reasoning, uh, th there is an idea that autism, in fact, is a modality of psychosis, right? So uh, this the idea that schizophrenia, paranoia, melancholia, and autism are, um, four different modalities of psychosis. So, and this is um, an argument that, uh, yeah, it's not preposterous. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to distinguish the two. How do I do that? I'll tell you how uh, briefly, and I'll forward you to my book or to some of my publications that you're welcome to receive if you send me an email. Um, uh, when Freud uh, and this, we talked about this, Mike, in the previous lecture on the paradigms of psychosis and Freud. Freud is very explicit when he says that um, in order to distinguish neurosis and psychosis, we cannot uh, base ourselves on the level of symptom of symptoms, right? We cannot of apparent symptoms. We cannot say, oh yes, hallucinations, delusions. Uh, this is psychosis, and uh, let's say. Um, uh, Let's say self-reproach, uh, thoughts of self-reproach. Okay, this is neurosis. We, we cannot do that because Freud says, well, we see them all in both structures. Right? Uh, neurotics also hallucinate sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, what he says is that we have to pay attention to the first structuring element uh, that we associate as the cause of neurosis and psychosis. In repression, this is called, in, <laughs> I told this is a Freudian slip, uh, in neurosis, it's called repression. Yes, repression is the cause of neurosis. And, um, well, 
when we say neurosis, we actually say the outcome of repression. In psychosis, Freud talked about rejection and Lacan talked about foreclosure, foreclusion. We'll talk about this next month, about Lacan and foreclosure. But what I would say is that these structuring mechanisms distinguish between neurosis and psychosis. And in my work, um, what I've spent several years um, developing is a meticulous distinction between these constitutive mechanisms in psychosis and autism. So what I do is I don't say, oh, autism and psychosis are distinct because they're different symptoms, because that's not necessarily true. There's many um, overlapping symptoms in both cases, which many times cause a false diagnosis, by the way. Many psychotic subjects, which in the Lacanian orientation we would call ordinary psychotic subjects, meaning psychotic subjects that didn't experience a psychotic break, but are structured as psychotic, we'll talk about this in the next lecture, are diagnosed as autistic. Right? And uh, what, what I suggest is that the mechanism of psychotic foreclosure is distinct from the mechanism that is the cause for autism, which I very, in a very unoriginal way, call autistic foreclosure. Right? So I distinguish between psychotic foreclosure and autistic closure. And I do this on three levels that I'd love to you to read and, and give your, me your notes at. Uh, first, on the level of their, mm, let's say, the domain of their operation. And I would say that uh, psychos psychotic foreclosure operates on a level that is, let's say, symbolic. It is minimally symbolic, but it's still symbolic. And autistic foreclosure operates on a level that is very much um, attributed to the drive, uh, to what Freud called representatives of the drive. I'll, I won't say it in German because it's a very long word. Uh, another way I distinguish them is by their object. What is the object foreclosed? And I demonstrate, according to Lacan, that in psychosis it is the signifier of the name of the father. So for those of you that are not Lacanians that I bore you right now, but in psychosis this is what Lacan said. And in autism, I suggest that, well, I give several suggestions as to what it is, generally associating it with the rim of the drive. Rim is a concept that Freud introduces when he discusses um, the drive. And finally, I distinguish them on the effect that they have on the subject's mode of access to language. So we would definitely uh, distinguish uh, the mode of access to language that we associate with psychosis and autism. Briefly, I would say that while the, uh, in fact, yes, it's true that the psychotic subject resides in a reality um, that is, uh, a, let's say, has a, a, a hole in it. Hmm? It, is, it lacks a certain universal consistency. It is still symbolic. Whereas autistic subject, that's how I argue at least, have no access to the domain of signifiers. They have a sole recourse to signs. This is a different theory that I develop. I haven't talked about this today at all because I promised myself not to, because I usually talk about this. So I promised myself today to talk about something completely different. So yes, so this is the hypothesis and this is how I distinguish the two uh, on these structural levels. And Thess, you're welcome to, to read more about that and let me know what you think. Here. Okay, thank you, Seth. Uh, next, we've got uh, Bob Inns from um, who's got a question. Okay, how's it, Bob? Yeah, okay, Bob, you mute. We have to unmute you. Yeah, Bob, to unmute. yeah can, you, can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, hi, you can hear me now. I, I, I have a brother who's nine years younger than me and who was born. Um, uh, my mother and his mother was very ill when he was born. She died shortly afterwards. Um, now, he's he's an he's an Asperger boy. Now, I've been fascinated in his life for 
25 years you know i studied him and um um i i believe that there's a that there's a deprivation uh you know it, it, of of motherhood it is the cause uh, of his uh, asperger autist behavior so what is your take on that what is your take Well, uh, Bob, thanks. Thank you for sharing uh, this with us. Yes, uh, yes. And um, I would say you're not alone in your hypothesis. Right? Uh, many books behind me um, will support this hypothesis, this idea that a certain yeah. um, distance uh, has thing to do with a traumatic separation from the mother is uh, situated at the onset of autism. And I think that you know, it is um, it is always um, it is always the case when um, when we um, when we dress up our case studies, and there is no other way to engage with them, right? Because when we present a case study, we always present our fantasies in relation to the subject's speech, right? We, we never present the subject itself. And when yeah. we do that, we, we also garnish these case studies with our terminologies and concepts. And in this sense, when we engage with biographies, we all also do that. That's our way to engage with them. This is the way to discuss them and to maybe create knowledge that uh, might uh, surpass them. But it is a fact that not all children that grew up with a distant even malevolent or non-existent mother grow up to be autistic. And uh, on the other hand, we see autistic children growing up with fantastic mothers that were very warm, um, exemplary, one would say, yeah. or as Winnicott says, good enough at least, but then still uh, go on to be uh, autistic uh, as adults, autistic subjects. And here I think Bettelheim's comment, so I'll present, I'll present a comment from within yeah. the supporters of your argument, Bob, and then I'll present my, my sort of my yeah. Um, yeah. Provo provocation of a take on it. Um, for, so yeah. for Bettelheim, yes, he would say, he, as I said, he would say, yes, uh, a distant called mother might be a cause of autism, but only if a subject spontaneously chooses to react in a particular way to it. Right? So what we are dealing with in psychoanalysis is not so much a, a series of bad mothers, but a series of children, if we follow your, uh, your suggestion, that spontaneously reacted in a particular way to a certain separation that was traumatic from their care. Yeah, an absent mother, an absent mother. Absent. That that was the thing with yes. absent. She she just wasn't there. She was very ill. He yes. he didn't have any uh, care, maternal care, when he was young. Yes, and you know, and he's far different from me. You know, uh, um, I I had that. You know, he's strikingly different, but we have genetic similarities. Yes, you know, the the, the, the environment created the difference. Yes, you know he's only five foot. He's only five foot one. I'm six foot two. I'm heavy. He's very small. He's undernourished. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, but there's huge differences uh, because he didn't didn't have a mother when he was small. Mm -hmm. So, so let me offer you, Bob, my sort of take on it. Um, yeah. I would say that maybe what we are dealing with here is in fact a certain trauma. Um, on the level of a, the subject's introduction to the mother's tongue, then this would be my suggestion, right? That, well, something at that time, at that point in his life, uh, created um, the circumstances that um, enabled him to choose uh, to refuse to invest, let's say his yeah. being in his mother's tongue, right? He, he, was, he had a deprivation, maternal deprivation, mm. like Ch Ch Ceausescu's children in Romania. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, and, and what Bettelheim studied in the Second World War. 
yes, indeed. Yeah. We're going to have to move on. I've got quite a lot of questions, but thanks, yeah. Bob. Thank you, okay. Bob. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, I've got some questions I'm going to read out. Uh, the one is from uh, Zaza uh, Mamalushavili, and she's asking, could, confront, could, a, could a confrontation ap approach by working precisely on traumatic experiences be used in psychotherapy for or, autistic patients? Any experience on that? Uh, and, and Leon, we've got quite a few questions. So, uh, well, let's see. That, I'm gonna, we'll start with that one. Yeah. Okay, I'll briefly answer um, because we have uh, many questions. Um, working with autistic patients could be extremely frustrating on, on, on all, how they say, uh, levels of the spectrum. It's not only uh, the work with, um, let's say, um, these children that uh, have sort of uh, have not uh, entered language in, in, uh, in any sufficient way. Uh, it can also be a work with, uh, as, as Bob was mentioning, um, Asperger's patients. Um, it's sometimes very frustrating because it feels, it seems like they do not listen. And many times in, in, in these discussions among practitioners, uh, uh, there is a discussion of these sometimes feelings of aggressiveness hmm? a, a, and a, uh, a wish to confront. Yes. But I think that um, it, the, the thing that is, um, that is a characterizing um, autistic subjects is the fact that they are extremely careful in engaging um, this uh, particular traumatism on, on the level of uh, the alienation in language. And in this sense, I would say that a conf confrontation or conf a confrontative approach would go against uh, at least the framework that, that I am suggesting. Uh, I am suggesting um, a practice that is, uh, on the contrary, is very um, uh, sensitive to um, exactly these repetitions and um, and constant engagement with uh, with utterances and, and objects, uh, rather than forcing uh, the subject to learn something. And in this, my approach is very different to the one proposed by ABA uh, practitioners, which come to teach the autistic subject something in terms of, um, let's say, adapting the subject to a certain objective reality. Um, in this sense, I would say that this kind of forcing or this kind of pedagogy, um, to me, uh, would be situated outside the confines of what we can call psychoanalytic. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we've got Manuel Gabbard. I hope I said your name right, Manuel. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have a question, Leon. Um, Good to see you. Um, I have a question that maybe is uh, a bit misphrased because I'm uh, because repression is uh, a mechanism of neurosis. But I was wondering um, when Lacan says that for the neurotic. Uh, the repressed returns from the symbolic, and maybe for the psychotic, it returns from the real. Um, where does it return from for the person, the subject? Does it return from the rim, or yes? Yes, so this is a fantastic and well informed question, uh, Manuel. Thank you. It's uh, clearly demonstrating that uh, you've been engaging with the subject uh, deeply. Uh, it's true, um, you know, Lacan has this theory of the registers, the three registers, and um, he's very adamant in saying that it is very useful uh, because it allows us to avoid um, many shortcomings um, in uh, psychoanalytic theorization. Particularly, he says that they 
provide a much simpler way to understand the subject's relation to the object. And Lacan goes uh, drastically against the Kleinian object relation school and also uh, against the ego psychology school. And uh, he uses the theory of the three registers in order to do that. Now, I, I won't um, provide a lecture on that today. Could be a good idea, but not today. But I would say that Lacan also distinguishes between these mechanisms, as Manuel was saying, between repression and foreclosure in terms of the symbolic imaginary. Um, he says that, well, in repression, uh, what is uh, repressed for Freud is an idea, right? For Freud talks about repression as detachment of an idea from its accompanying affect, and the idea is then pushed or inscribed in the unconscious. So for Lacan, what is repressed in neurosis as an idea is a signifier. So Lacan calls this a signifier. And he says that, well, when a signifier is repressed, it returns in the form of a symptom. This is Freudian. This is 100% Freudian. Freud says that repression has two aspects. There are two sides of the same coin. The inscription in the unconscious, what is pushed in the unconscious, and what returns in the form of symptom, in symptomatic formation. Right. So. Lacan says that when a signifier is repressed in neurosis, it returns in the symbolic, in reality. It returns in thought, let's say. It returns as these thoughts that revolve around something unclear, but keep on revolving around it, right? It affects uh, the way that uh, the subject conceptualizes a reality and the body, right? Something revolves around this repressed signal. In analysis, we, um, what we do is we identify these, um, let's say, uh, Lacan, Lacan calls these master signifiers. These are signifiers that have a uttermost meaning. They sort of organize, they have a very strong power on the subject's discourse. And we identify them and we dialectize them. We, uh, in a way, uh, make them, make uh, these dead ends of discourse, uh, which uh, cause this compulsion, repetition, and the suffering, neurotic suffering, we dialectize them, we turn them into pathways. Right? So this would be the work with neurosis. And when Lacan talks about psychosis, he says that, well, what is foreclosed in the symbolic, so a signifier is foreclosed in the symbolic, but in psychosis, in foreclosure, it does not return in the symbolic, like in neurosis, but it returns in the real. Uh, the real is another register that Lacan defines. We might say that it is, um, well, uh, experienced as um, a, 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 a hole. Hmm? I, would be, I would be metaphorical now, a black hole. Uh, I will give you a metaphor from mathematics. Whereas repression manifests itself as a lack in reality, meaning it is a hole with a rim. It's a hole that it can be localized and abides by the laws of the system. A, a, a hole that caused by foreclosure has no rim. So it is not localized. And when we come to its threshold, it starts swallowing things up. Right? And Lacan would say that, well, whatever is foreclosed returns in the real. It returns as a whole in the symbolic rather than a lack in the symbolic. It returns as a place where, which lacks consistency, which renders the whole of the symbolic construct, the whole of the symbolic reality at risk to collapse. And this is why we say that, well, you know, that psychosis usually triggers at a later age in the Lacanian orientation, we would say that it is triggered when the subject is brought up to the threshold of this hole and has to answer, has to provide a certain answer and has nothing uh, to, uh, to use in order to do that. There's nothing to plug this hole with. And then the symbolic is destabilized, right? And we see a psychotic break. Now, in autism, and this is uh, not my um, articulation, this is from Eric Laurent, a very um, prominent Lacanian psychoanalyst. Uh, he says that whatever is foreclosed in autism 
returns on the rim. And the rim is a very interesting notion. We haven't talked about it at all. Uh, I wrote several things about the autistic rim. Uh, there's soon going to be another long paper about this published, uh, about the autistic rim. Uh, but we might say that one of the, I will be very brief, one of the uh, Im imperatives or crucial missions that autistic subjects find themselves uh, having to fulfill is to fabricate a rim to the body. A rim to the body, when I speak about it in psychoanalytic terms, as the libidinal body, as the body that, uh, let's say, has openings to the environment, the body that uh, uh, is a source of excitation. So a, a huge problematic in autism is uh, the fact that there is no access to signifiers, to language in a particular way, the body lacks a rim, and there is no distinction between, let's say, the body and the environment. Uh, in this sense, there's a constant experience of invasion of stimuli in and outside of the body described by autistic subjects. And one of the supplementary strategies to cope with this is to construct a rim. So in autism, we would say that whatever is foreclosed returns on the rim. And by th these three types of um, returnings, we gain um, a different way to establish a differential clinic between neurosis, psychosis, and autism. In neurosis, what is repressed returns in the symbolic, in foreclosure it returns, what foreclosed returns in the real, and in autism, it returns on the autistic neo-rim, on the autistic secondary rim. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, um, for the question. Uh, Leon, I think we are out of time. So, and I think, uh, uh, Leon, you sort of offered if they want, they can mail you. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I extend this offer to all of you. Uh, you can easily uh, send me a message using my website. Uh, it's quite narcissistically uh, titled leonbrenner.com. So you can find uh, you can find the contact menu there and send me your question. And I'll do my best to answer it. And thank you very much again, Leon, for your for your time and for sharing your mind so generously with all of us. So thank you, and have a good evening, everyone. Yes, likewise. Thank you all for coming.